and welcome to Hospice Insights, The Lawn Beyond, where we connect you to what matters in the ever-changing world of hospice and palliative care. Hospice Innovator Series, Stories of Successful Hospice Leadership, the CEO and Chief Medical Officer Relationship. Diana and Ed, I've been wanting to do this podcast since before COVID, and here you are. So thank you for joining me today. Well, my pleasure to be here. Yeah, well, well, I've known both of you for a really long time and really admired the relationship that the two of you have forged together. And maybe for our listeners, you could talk a little bit about your origin story of working together, and then we can sort of talk about that, how, how that's evolved over time. Hello, everyone. I'm Diana Franquito, and um, I began in hospice around 15 years ago. Prior to that, I spent a few decades in the acute care hospital world and uh, transitioned over to hospice. And it was in an uh, an acting CEO role. And um, and the first thing I did once I got the permanent job was that I immediately called Ed Martin, and even before I notified my husband, and let him know <laughs> that I really needed a full-time chief medical officer. He was only part-time at that time, and uh, Ed said he'd think about it overnight, and he <laughs> first thing the next morning, and then I told my husband <laughs> I got the job. So, so we've been working together now for a good 15 years, and uh, we'll certainly delve into that in a few minutes. Yeah, well, I, I found, and I, re- I remember where I was when you first told me this story. We were at an NPHI meeting, and I just found it fascinating because I think that Looking at hospice today, people would say, oh, of course, your physician is your you know, right hand and that role is, is so critical to the organization um, in so many different ways. But I think you really saw that because how many years ago was that, Diana? 15. And, you know, coming from a hospital background, you know, your physician partnership is so critical. And when I came transitioned to hospice, it was very transactional and kind of approval and administrative back then. And it just seemed odd that, you know, you wouldn't have a, a, a dyad, so to speak, between your CMO and your CEO. Yeah. So, Ed, you got that phone call 15 years ago. Um and you took the night to think about it. And so um, clearly the fact that she she asked you so early on, knowing that you were going to be an instrumental player, I guess, how did you feel about that? Well, it was great news for me. Um, you know, as Diana said, I was part time at that. I mean, I started in hospice in 1987 in a very part time wow. that, you know, gradually grew over the years. But I was still part time when, you know, Diana called. Um and I think historically in hospice, at times the medical director's role has been, uh, or a physician role has been, um, you know, come sign the forms at IDG and and uh, and that that'll do it. Um, and I think Diana's vision was a, was of a much more you know active and involved uh, you know medical director, which seemed great to me. So I was uh, thrilled to have the opportunity. So what were you doing at, you're doing the hospice part-time in 1987, and then you're doing other stuff. So what was your background coming to hospice well, work? Well, I was in primary, I was a primary care physician. Okay. Uh, I was doing some work with addiction medicine. I was doing some work with a, a long-term a geriatrics hospital. And um, as my hospice work increased over the years, I gradually, you know, reduced some of the others. But uh, in 2008, after speaking with Diane, I made a, you know, clean break and went, uh, you know, was able to go full time. Yeah. So, well, it's such a wonderful story about how you you came together, and then I think. <laughs> When you say 2008, I mean, that is so what I mean in, in hospice years, like so light years uh, away, because in 2008, we were talking about the new cops came out. Right. That was like a big deal. And now in terms of, you know, where we are now and the amount of enforcement we're dealing with and all that stuff. So um, but let's talk a little bit about. So we're we're back 15 years. How did you come to forge this relationship and how, and then we can sort of talk about nuts and bolts kinds of things about how you guys work together. But, and maybe just for our listeners, Diana, you could give us a little background about hope a little bit so we can um, 
which I think now it's Hope Health. But right. why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about the program? Because I think some of the ways you've partnered together is is reflective of how you've been able to grow and expand in new and different ways. Sure. So <clears throat> Hope Health is a hospice and palliative care organization formerly known as Hope Health Hospice and Palliative Care. And our geographic territory is from the Boston city limits uh, to uh, Block Island in Rhode Island, which is all the way the southern part of the state. So two states we cover. Our census is about 750 average daily census. And we have a very strong and robust palliative care um, organization. Um, and I think the census for palliative care is closer to 1,000. And, um, and we have about 50 providers. Uh, half nurse practitioners and the other half physicians. And we are the academic affiliate of the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University for hospice and palliative care, meaning we have the privilege of training all of the learners at Brown on end of life. And it is a fairly robust contractual agreement that we have with Brown to do such. And Ed has been the leading force uh, behind that over the years. So very academically focused organization as well. So that's kind of Hope Health very um, at a very high level. Um, And then in terms of our working relationship, by way of background, I am not a clinician. So I have an MBA. I'm a fellow of the American uh, College of Healthcare Executives. And so it was really important for me to have a chief medical officer, one obviously that I trusted, but that had very deep and sound clinical um, expertise, and not just clinical expertise, but really good judgment. And so that was what led me to um, further our discussion about Ed joining Hope Health full time. And so that's really what I was looking for because I needed to be able to trust, uh, particularly not having a clinical background. And there's pros and cons to um, having the CEO CMO balanced uh, with a clinician or not a clinician. And mm. uh, and that has been a really important um, priority for me as the, the medical team at um, Hope Health has evolved over the years. Yeah, trust and judgment. That is so, so critical because you work collaboratively, but you have very different purviews in terms of what you're you're doing. And I know when we were prepping for this podcast, um, I was looking back through my notes and Ed was saying that that Diana gets stuff done. (laughs) You know, you are, you know, have vision and really passionate and getting stuff done. I guess, Ed, how do you, how do you balance that? Or how do you play into that? And where's the line of what you do versus Diana does as it relates to how you intersect? Well, I've learned my emails are even more effective if I copy Diana. (laughs) <laughs> to uh, her new organization. So I <laughs> learned that. But I say, I mean, Diane has been very supportive of sort of the independent medical judgment of the um of the medical staff. And I and I know some of my colleagues, you know, find they're often pressured to admit a patient who they don't think is eligible not to discharge a patient they don't think is eligible to make a patient GIP. They don't think meets GIP. And I I can say I've never had that from Diana. And so I really respect the you know the, the boundaries we've had in that regard, and and she said she she trusts the you know judgment of I think mean, you know we we're very fortunate to have a great you know clinical staff, great uh, uh, provider staff, and she trusts our, our judgment. So that's you know that's been you know so helpful. And I say I mean if we have an initiative that needs to happen, Diana will make sure it happens, and that's who who needs to be at the table, what needs to happen, what how it needs to get supported. Um, so uh, so that's been you know from my perspective you know that's been you know has been great. And I think in today's enforcement climate, where I think every hospice in the country of any size is on multiple different uh-huh. reviews. It also means standing by your physicians Mm -hmm. and defending Mm -hmm. that clinical judgment through the appeal process and other things, which I think is really important because, you know, while I think being pragmatic is helpful, like, you know, what's the cost benefit? But I also think, you know, standing by your physicians means, you know, we're going to defend the clinical decisions you make and appeal things that should be appealed. um, And... And I know, Ed, you play a big role in that in terms of 
you know, you have a, a, a lot of experience testifying if need be or other things. And so so tell me how you approach it, because uh, Diana was just saying 50, 50 clinicians. So that's NPs and physicians. Do you have any PAs? We don't have PA simply because okay. in hospice, their work is restricted. So as yeah. today, we, we don't have any PAs. Um, but I think from, you know, in terms of the, on the hospice side, you know, because this came up last week, one of the physicians asked me, gee, I'm not sure about, you know, recertification, have, have the standards changed? I hear about all this review. Yeah. And my standard has always been, will you, do you feel confident sitting down and explaining to an administrative law judge why you thought this patient had a prognosis of six months or less if the disease produced patient. And if you feel confident, if you feel, yes, absolutely, that's something I can do. Now, if you think, oh boy, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not sure I'd want to tell it, you know, then no, we can't be, you know, recertifying that patient. And so that's the, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, that's always the, you know, the judgment I've tried to make is, um, you know, are these sound clinical decisions that are defensible clinically, uh, but then ultimately that you would be willing to argue, you know, and if another physician shows up at the hearing that you'd be able to argue with that physician and make your case. In my judgment, this patient absolutely was you know, eligible for hospice services and here are my reasons or was eligible for general inpatient GIP level services and these are my reasons. So. So that's been sort of the, the bottom line clinically. Palliative care has been, that's been sort of a wonderful expansion. That's, um, you know, years ago, I think, you know, oncologists were a little bit anxious about having palliative care docs in their centers, thinking we would pull everyone out of treatment and make everybody go home mm -hmm. in hospice. And, and, and now, you know, as of today, we have, you know, four full-time docs in our, in our academic cancer center. Um, and their work is tremendously valued by our oncology team. So I think, you know, things are, things have certainly changed. Um, and there's, there's such, you know, and in the hospitals, uh, again, things have changed so much in terms of, you know, the value of palliative care, the importance of palliative care. You know, we, we launched, uh, this past year at, uh, in the emergency department at one of our hospitals, uh, uh and we had a meeting last week where the, the presented to the results of the board and they found that, the, the length of stay, if we initiated a palliative care consult in the ED with our ED boarded, palliative care boarded physician in the emergency department, their length of stay was about half of what um, what it would be had the consult started you know, when they were up on a unit. Uh, they thought it prevented, you know, 200 admissions since the, the, uh, the wow. project started and saved a couple million dollars. Um, so it was a great investment for them to support uh, the, our physician down in the emergency department. So I think there's you know, there's been, you know, we've been, you know, certainly welcomed by the by the medical community here. And we've had great support from Hope and from Diana in terms of, you know, launching these initiatives. So switching gears, like, okay, who comes up with that idea? And how do you work <laughs> together on that? Like, let's take, you know, either the emergency department, maybe let's start there, because I I haven't heard someone doing something as structured as you did. Like, how did you cook that up? Whose idea was it? How did you partner together? Walk us through that. You know, Dan, did you want to? Sure. So, um, so you know, uh, I just want to go back one second to your question about kind of the balance between um, your CMO and CEO. And, you know, in the early days when we started working together, I would often say to Ed, well, what do you do with those gray hospice patients? And you're not sure if they should be admitted to hospice or not. And um, just, you know, eligibility, but boy, am I ever so grateful that we stayed on the, the, the right side, particularly given this incredibly aggressive um, oversight and regulatory environment that we're in now. So that has been in just your call, you are the chief medical officer, your call. And so that has really been um, an important strategy and getting toward um, to, you know, these strategic investments that we make, sometimes it comes from our partners. Other times it comes from, you know, one of the other providers, our physicians, our VP of medical staff services, or Ed, you know, and, um, and it just depends and we, we meet very regularly with our healthcare partners. And if there is a need that they're identifying a concern or a problem they have, they may not know the solution, but boy, could Hope Health be a part of the solution? That's where we, um, you know, healthcare systems, number one pain point, length of stay. Yeah. 
yeah, how, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there is a potential solution for that. And so we figure out what's going, what it's going to take from an investment and how we would, how we would make that. And I'd have to say palliative care is one of the, our top strategic investments over the years. Other hospice and, and health, other hospice and palliative care organizations often go in different, different directions. Our, our growth in palliative care has led to a significant growth in, in hospice. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the outcome you're talking about with this emergency department visit, because oftentimes you're talking about palliative care in the hospital, and it's like, I've been here for three weeks, and now I get a palliative care visit, and were there, you know, nearly at the end of life, and I, I think probably not the best sort of for everyone, I mean, glad they got a palliative care visit, but, you know, when's that right time, and I think that um, healthcare is not immune to sort of the fiefdoms we have, the silos. And so, you know, and I'd imagine in my experience, when you have a physician needs to get buy-in from other physicians and you can't just be the business leader saying, hey, this is a good thing, right? So so I, how in terms of, because you have your academic medical center with Brown, that fellowship program in this, like how do you team that approach because you've obviously developed really strong partnerships that they didn't see it as competing with them but in essentially we're going to all do this better together and this plays into our you know large strength like how do you how do you do that because i i think you've done it really successfully and i think other folks sort of struggle uh to to sometimes get that collaboration going on with hospital partners and others. Diana, do you want to? No, go for it. Ed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in terms of you know academic partners, I mean it was the, the, I think there's a recognition this is such important you know information for their students and residents and, and to get. You know we had a, a you know strong partnership with the division of geriatrics which is now the division of geriatrics and palliative medicine actually so we had an oh, okay. academic home at brown and you know for years we had been training a lot of their medical students and their residents um and so i think this was really a more formal recognition the fact that they actually made us a formal affiliate um recognized all the work we do uh it's rare that one of our providers particularly in the hospitals in the academic hospitals doesn't have a learner with them either a medical student a medical resident a family medicine resident a surgical resident um so i think we do a tremendous amount of teaching and sort of the formalization of the you know, the act of making us an academic partner uh, really recognize that. But I think the tremendous value we bring, I mean, in terms of the fellowship, I mean, we basically provide the the training for the uh, for the fellows. And so I think it was a great opportunity to partner uh, with Brown and the Department of Medicine and the Division of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine uh, to create a fellow. I mean, first, we started in uh, 2012 with one fellow. And a couple of years later, we had two fellows. Um, last year, we, we got up to four fellows. We had four. Wow. We had for four. So uh, there's been you know tremendous growth in that area as well. When we were talking about this, it's so exciting because talk about making change sort of from the inside out, right? If we don't change physician training and all of those things, then we're not really going to really advance end of life care in our country. So, you know, which I think at the end of the day, don't we all want to make a difference, not just at a patient level, but sort of a structure level? Because I think we've always been sort of well, that's hospice and palliative care, not really truly integrated. And and um, so so anyway, that's super exciting. Um, and I'd imagine that takes a lot of work to do. And that's not something, Diana, you can just go meet with the CEO and say, hey, this is great idea we have. You need someone like Ed at your side doing that. So how do you work together now? I've seen your offices are right next to each other, right? And so how do you work together? Um, is it, do you have structured meetings and <laughs> how, how, and do you have agendas? Like how, how do you guys work together? Uh, and I'm sure it's evolved over time. How did it start and where is it now? Yeah. Well, I would say it's the daily drive-bys. Um, 
that you know our offices are adjacent to one another and so with that we have a lot of face time and that we can um, check in with one another you know we do meet regularly whether with other leaders on the staff or um uh, with our VP of medical staff services, where we t- we have more deliberate time talking, whether it's about provider staffing, whether it's about a certain strategic initiative. But it's so important, given the role of the CMO, that it's not restricted to the first and third Thursday of the month. Things yeah. happen so mm-hmm. quickly, and it's so important that we're in lockstep with one another. So I, you know, and then particularly with the um, the regulatory environment, I I just think this, you know, these daily check ins are are um, are critical, and um, and sometimes we need to spend fifteen minutes with each other, and other times, no, all good, great, good, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and we move on. But I I find that that's really important. And the other piece as well, it's really helpful to have a uh, a trusted CMO that has inordinate judgment that I can collaborate with. And particularly as we're trying to talk with our board of directors, the Hope Health Board of Directors, about a new initiative, a new strategic investment, that he brings that clinical perspective that, you know, yes, I appreciate it and understand it, but at, particularly Ed is still a practicing palliative care uh, physician, that it's really helpful. Or if it's about our affiliation with Brown, it's really, really helpful to have that. And something I've always really admired about you, Ed, is that you are still very hands-on. I mean, you have obviously a leadership role, and you know, but you're balancing that with hands-on care because I'd imagine you think that's important, but also it probably feeds your your soul, so to speak, because you know sometimes when you get more removed and everything becomes administrative, <laughs> you know, I know even in my job you're like, hey, but but. I was a really good physician or, you know, whatever that is. And so tell me about why you continue to take a patient load. Yeah. Well, one, that's what I love doing um, is taking care of patients. So if I gave, I mean, it would make no sense to me to give that up. And I think it makes me a much better sort of leader in terms of, I mean, because I mean, I take call, I take regular call at nights and weekends. And so I don't ask my other providers to do what I'm not doing. Um, and I think that's, I think that's important. And, um, and I think, you know, I make home visits. I, you know, I so I try and do some, you know, and it's because it often makes me aware of things. Gee, this could be, you know, this could be done a little better. And, uh, you know, during COVID, you know, we took care of COVID patients. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I, I just think it's, uh, uh, it's what I enjoy. So fortunately, it's what I enjoy. Yeah. It also yeah. has, uh, has other benefits as well. Yeah. Well, tell me what are some of the other things that you're, you're cooking up, if you can talk about them? Like, <laughs> where do you see things going? I mean, because we talked about audit and enforcement and all of that stuff. And, Obviously, I do lots of that, but as I always say, this can't run your business, right? Like you can't get so caught up and like let that define like what you spend all of your time doing. So you need to come up with new strategic initiatives and new all this other stuff. So I I guess, where do you see the future? I mean, you've talked some about palliative care, and I know you guys have home health too. And so like, I feel like we're really siloed right now and like there's hospice and then there's home health and then palliative care, which no one really understands. Like, where do you think things are going? And, um, you know, cause obviously you have several different business lines. Do you see all of that converging in some way or like, what's your vision? Well, um, I'll take a stab at it and then Ed, feel free to chime in. Um, so clearly the regulatory world will be with us for the foreseeable future. It will shift, it will change some, it may scale back only in our dreams, but it will <laughs> always be there. And I've often said, Ed has a, has an honorary JD behind his <laughs> other credentials and initials yeah. as well, because the defense that he's had to do for the care of our patients has been just inordinate. And so, um, so, so that's there, whether we call it strategy or not, it's really, you have to have a very sound approach to your, 
um, fr from the regula regulatory side, be that as it may. I think, you know, one of the interesting things about New England is it's things things kind of starting on the West Coast or the Midwest, and then they come forward. So what I find really helpful is, you know, particularly with our NPHI alignment is, you know, what are the experiences of our colleagues in other regions of the United States, whether it's VBID, whether it's a very aggressive payer community, um, and learning from them, but before it kind of hits the New England area, it's, um, and so I'm, I'm, uh, we are very focused on, you know, developing those payer networks and uh, relationships that are going to be so much more critical in the future. And, um, and, you know, we're, we're always thinking about, you know, another other ways to grow our hospice program and our palliative care program. But I think, you know, in seeing, you know, home health, for example, it has really been commoditized. And I worry that it will happen to hospice, you know, and will it at, at some point pa happen to palliative care. And so I think those are the things that we're very focused on um, as we as we move forward. But, you know, regardless of the strategy, Ed has great, just an intuitive sense of, does this make sense? Should we be mm. moving in this direction or not? Whether it's informed by our market and our healthcare partners, but just having just good, uh, a good, whether it's intuition or instinct, I should say, is mm. really kind of the one of the things that I most value um, in yeah. working with Ed. Does it make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I'm... many, you know, <laughs> meetings when that go on and on does this make sense, right? <laughs> like that that sort of pragmatic and because we can all get into theoretical stuff, but sometimes I feel like time is wasted because like, does this actually make sense? <laughs> so to have someone be able to say, but does this make sense? You, you know, and then we can save hours of our lives not being in sometimes countless meetings or initiatives that, and, and I, I think from a leadership standpoint, I, I don't know how this, bears out for you. Um, but sometimes you, have, you cook up a great idea and then it's not working and it's okay to say, yeah, this didn't work. Let's move on to something else instead of, you know, doubling down and, and then, you know, a year passes. So I love, does this make sense? Well, you know. a, a perfect example, Meg, is remember when CMMI came out with that model? What was, what was the name of the model? It, Ed, it was the, um, yeah. You know, the monthly Medicare care month. choices, yes, yeah. Medicare care choices. And so the t the turnaround on that was pretty quick. And, you know, I took a couple of days to read through it a couple of times. And Ed and I talked and we just said, no, it's going to cannibalize our census. And it's just it is such a short length of stay in our region where we are anyway, that we just said no, but we didn't take a long time. We just we read mm -hmm. it and we just made the decision and. Uh, for us, really glad that we chose not to participate in it. Yeah. It was a demonstration project to demonstrate can hospice be provided for $12 a day. <laughs> yeah. Really? Really? Is that what? Is that what I know. Oh, yeah. So. yeah, $400. Do yeah. everything you yeah. normally do, yeah. but <laughs> then you just don't have to cover the drugs and the yeah. DME, but like do everything else. Yeah. Yeah. No, you could see where that was headed, right? Yeah. Is like, um, but, well, I think having, a, a, as you said, trusted partner, because I think being a boss can be sometimes lonely and you need a strong C-suite team to really, like, compliment you and, right, the best team is going to have, you know, we all have weaknesses, we all have strengths and how you balance each other out. And you guys balance each other out in a really great way, not just, like, Obviously, your substantive skills are different, but I mean, you're peer to peer. And so I'm sure Ed can say things to you that other people can't say to you and vice versa. Like, it's really good to have that partnership because, you know, when you're weathering storms, you really do want to have, you know, a partner and someone you trust to do that. Because I think, you know, the last five years have seen so much change and then just more to come, which I mean, I think it is a land of opportunity, but it is also, I think, somewhat scary. I mean, as positive as we all might want to be about, well, the future and maybe, you know, we can serve more people and we get out of our silo. There's also this, as you said, 
commoditizing what it is that we do. And if we move into V, you know, V bit and the carbon happens, like what does hospice look like then? And so, so anyway, I mean, I, I think having someone you trust to brain those things out of what makes sense for you, because as we know, you can listen to, hey, this was really successful for other people, but it's just not going to work for you. So, so anyway, I'm sure you guys all made the agreement you can't retire, right? <laughs> you can't retire. Um, you have that in writing. You yeah. never retire. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, one, one other thing I'll mention is one other thing I'm grateful for, Diana, is the, the leadership team she's assembled. Um, it's just so great to work with such a, you know, such a great, I mean, I'm fortunate to the VP for, you know, my, you know, for, for uh, clinical services, you know, Dr. Jen Ritzow, she does so much of the work that I would otherwise have to do from an administrative standpoint that then frees me to do the clinical work I do. But but if you look around the table at our senior leadership meetings, I mean, I'm just you know, so grateful for this group that you know, Diane has assembled. It's such great expertise and talent and commitment to the organization. It's just very gratifying to work with. Yeah, you've grown something really, really incredible. And um and I think you guys have fun doing it, right? Which, <laughs> right? This is, this is, it's, it's, we spend too much time at work not to, right. to also enjoy what we're doing. It was, um, Ed was talking about the team that we had assembled. So Ed and I, this was quite a while ago, we were at the NHPCO Management and Leadership Conference, oh, probably about eight years ago. And if you recall, um, Patrick Lencioni was the keynote speaker and his topic was trust at the speed of light. And it was uh, just kind of like this aha moment. And we both recognized that there was a key member of the senior leadership team, that that trust did not exist. And that yeah. Monday, we had that very uncomfortable conversation. And this was a while ago, and she was gone. But uh, but it was, uh, it, you really recognize, and I, I know it sounds trite, but if there's no trust among, or minimal trust among the CMO and the CEO, it's going to be hard days, you know, and so I'm I'm really grateful. That's a good, solid working relationship. Yeah, I, I I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that is, I mean, it, judgment, trust, you know, and then, you know, putting in the time and doing the work, um, you know, and that's what you expect of one another. And that's what you, you, you do. Um, so, well, this has been such a pleasure and I can't wait to hear what you guys are going to be cooking up next because. I mean, you guys are really doing a lot of um, exciting stuff, and I, I feel like we have that balance of reactionary things we need to do, but then also balancing that with like the strategic and how we can be better and blah, blah, blah. And um, when you were talking, I was just thinking about you know, everything's about data analytics these days. And so um, maybe I'll just throw in one last question because I wrote it down. <laughs> but um, like, how do you measure success on these these projects that you're working on? Because it sounds like with your emergency department thing, you're able to deliver a ton of data. Um, and how, because Obviously, to be able to do that, you need to have the right EMR and all these other things. Like, how do you manage or how do you use data to manage the things that you're doing? So does this make sense? Isn't, yes, there's some gut feel, but like, show me, right? This makes sense. So maybe before we leave, can you just, you know, chime in on that? Sure, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, Absolutely, the data has to support all of our strategic and initi initiatives. And in fact, uh, first Thursday of every month, our senior leadership has Dashboard Thursday, and we <sighs> review all of our dashboard, or I think it's the third Thursday of every month, we review all of our dashboards for all of our strategic initiatives, all of our partnerships with our various healthcare partners, and what trends are we noticing? Is this something that we need to, and inevitably, with um, we always come back, no, we need to slice and dice this a little different. And these this is these are the dashboards we share with our partners as well. And um, and so it's really important. So from a resource, you have to commit to a department of analytics within your organization. And you know, it's um but and we can share those dashboards, whether within our board or to our middle management. And um and our I have to say our partners have been so appreciative of the dashboards mm -hmm. because those dashboards allow them to take 
an initiative, whether to expand it or change it in some way to their um, to their leadership team. So it's been really a really important um, exercise, and it's it's how we are hardwired here at Hope Health. Yeah. Well. No, I agree completely. I mean, just just having the you know having the data. Um, as, you know, oftentimes, I mean, you, you can't just be saying, oh, we, we do God's work here. No, <laughs> no we need data. <laughs> yeah. And and I think some people are still in that old camp and it's like, but you got to prove it. And yeah. going back to what you said about payers and networks, and I mean, you got to be able to prove your right. value. People mm-hmm. want to know the cost of your care. People want to know, you know, what outcomes, you know, matter. And I think to just focus on things the government focuses on um, isn't going to lead you into, mm-hmm. you know, a successful business because that's reactionary data mm-hmm. analytics, right? Meg, think about this way. You know, all of the healthcare systems in the country are under inordinate financial pressure. And because of that pressure, they are going to absolutely require data and dashboards and how can they do things either with a partner or on their own. And uh, and as a partner, we have an obligation to give them data. And so I I I think it will only continue to increase. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that it, it seems like the pendulum is always swinging back and forth. Sometimes hospitals want to be in the business of hospice and then, then they sell off their hospice. And I mean, it just, I, I do think it's always, if, if you have a great partner out there, I mean, to not have the headache as we can all attest to of running this business, because I, I think even hospitals don't appreciate uh, all of the things that go into running mm. this business, which is very different than running a hospital, um, you know, or physician practice or whatever it may be. So, well, you two are our two people I I really respect and learn a lot from. And I've known known you both for a long time, but also just add your leadership from a clinical standpoint is just always really inspiring to me. Thanks, man. Um, and that you'll rumble when needed to, obviously with a smile and a bow tie. <laughs> but um, you know, when I hear you, you talk about clinical issues. You, you, it comes from both like this heartfelt place that you know what it is to take care of these people. And you know, when you're talking to someone who's never going to lay eyes on someone, and you know, doesn't bring your expertise. I mean. I will always bet on you, Ed. So oh, thank you. <laughs> so will I. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, well, I really appreciate both of you taking the time. This has been a really fun conversation. And thanks for sharing how you make the magic. Take care. Thanks, Meg. Yeah, thanks, Meg. Well, that's it for today's episode of Hospice Insights, The Law and Beyond. Thank you for joining the conversation. To subscribe to our podcast, visit our website at hushblackwell.com or sign up wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, may the wind be at your back.